right, welcome everyone. If you would, we have a few people coming in here. Just grab a seat somewhere. We're going to get started with a little bit of singing. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online on Facebook and on our website. Today's going to be a little bit different, obviously. Um, so if you would, just remain seated and we'll just sing. We'll glorify God today. We'll start with the chorus, He is Lord. We know it's true. Here we go. He is Lord. He is Lord. today. Thank you very much, Tori. Good morning, Graceway Baptist Church. Just a thought that we don't have to be in a particular building to be in church. The body of Christ is the people of the church. So the church is 
the folks who are gathered here and those who are gathered online. We're so happy that you're on today. If you're on Facebook, real quick, if you could hit that share button so the other folks that are around you are who are quarantined, self-quarantined, um, just don't like people. Make sure that we can get the message out to other folks. Uh, we saw on Thursday night when we had the service live stream that we had about 25 people the whole time, which is a lot larger than our normal um, view average. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to get it out. Um, hope you had the opportunity to greet one another with an holy elbow bump this morning. Um, I... A lot of folks are not shaking hands because of the coronavirus. I am not shaking hands because of the toilet paper shortage, which I'm very <laughs> concerned about. So, uh, yeah. All right. I'm going to move on. Let's jump into some announcements. Uh, make sure that you, uh, as I said, continually are sharing our services. We're going to be live streaming them until... Um, further notice solely um, not being in our Hill Center area. So um, if you have the opportunity to come to Pastor's House, you are more than welcome to come. If you are unable to, um, please join us on Facebook Live and continue to share the information on our website with your friends so that they'll be able to tune in on Facebook Live. You can find the link there and then share it with your friends on social media. Same thing goes for our Thursday night Bible study. If you can make it to Pastor's House, come on. If not, Join us on Facebook Live. We are going to continue having our prayer at the Supreme Court at 7 p.m. every Saturday until further notice. Um, and then if you want to get information, and this is a good way to find out about the changing events as we transition um, hopefully back into our normal physical services in the Hill Center, make sure that you sign up for our mobile alerts and you can send your mobile number to info at gracewaydc.com. That way you can stay up to date with the most latest and pertinent information. We've got Prayer going on 24-7 for coronavirus, not just among our church, but in churches across the nation. We want to have an opportunity to specifically pray for a number of folks that are listed under the upcoming events section in your bulletin. And we're also going to have a prayer chain lineup. So if you look in your bulletin, you'll see times listed for the different groups that are going to be assigned to pray around the clock. For coronavirus, for the victims, for those families who are in need. And then we also have an opportunity, which I'll get to in just a second, to reach out directly to our community. More upcoming events, picnic on the mall on the 21st, combined small groups on the 22nd. We've got our Seder service still in Lincoln Hall as of now on April the 9th. Obviously, that could change depending on how things move, so keep an eye out for updates. Sign up for those updates. D.C. Scavenger Hunt on the 11th, Resurrection Sunday on the 12th, and there's a Shenandoah hiking trip on the 25th. Make sure to also download our Graceway D.C. app. Uh, we've got a flyer in the back that Miss Wells pointed out to me before I came up, and I was looking this morning in the Bible about how this isn't the first time something like this has happened in our nation or even around the world or even in ancient times. And I was thinking, who in the Bible before had self-quarantined or had been separated from somebody else? And I thought of Naaman, who had leprosy. And I, I looked and, and I was looking in the scriptures like, well, what did they do differently? And I saw that you, you hear that Elijah told him to go and bathe seven times in the Jordan. Well, if you look, he sent a messenger to go tell him to bathe seven times in the Jordan. And so uh, we want to have an opportunity to to reach out to our community. We want to be the messengers to the people of Washington, D.C., who might be separated from others at this time. And we've got a Here to Help flyer, and it talks about how we can help others in our community care for their family members and friends during this coronavirus crisis with food, water, and supplies. Make sure that you grab one of these on your way out and find out how you can help out in our community. Our memory verse this week is Hebrews eleven eighteen through 19, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Let's read that together this morning as a church. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in the figure. Hebrews 11, 18, 19. Thank you very much, Luke. We're going to uh, go ahead and just start singing one more time. We're going to sing Jesus, thank you. In everything, give thanks, right? Wherever we're at. I'll wait for the words to come up there. Here we go.
go. The mystery of the cross I cannot come. singing today with amazing grace how sweet the sound my chains are gone
Pastor, I'll turn it over to you at this time. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be with you, and thank you for those people that are online. And uh, We do miss you, and wish you could be here with us. Amen. And uh, let's give our online viewers a hand. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Appreciate you. Take God's holy word, if you would, God's precious book, and go to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. And we are going to be looking at uh, really the book as a whole. I'll just kind of give an overview. And uh, the thought here this morning is to give us some very specific um, instructions, four specific principles to knowing God's direction. And so uh, let me ask you this question. Can or does God direct? Does God direct people? Is there such a thing as divine direction? Or maybe I can ask you this. How can I determine God's direction for my life? How do I know what God wants me to do? And the book of Esther is an interesting book. One of the most curious things to me is there's no mention of God, the name of God in the book at all. It doesn't mention God. But yet, that's the whole purpose of the book is to, is to reveal the hand of God through what many people would say, well, that's just chance and circumstance, and that's, that's not God. And that's exactly what happens in any secular society. People start saying, well, uh, we're here by chance. Everything in my life is by chance. God's not directing. God's really not in charge. Um, humanity's in charge. And the Bible comes right out against that. I want you to look at chapter 4 and verse number 14. And then we'll, then we'll read a portion. I think this is one of the most wonderful passages of Scripture. Esther 4 and verse number 14. The Bible says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But if thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? That passage right there, for such a time as this, rings and reverberates through many ministries. And many, many people have said this on various occasions. As my wife and I prayed about the direction of our church for this year and we really settled on this series, Decisions for the Decade. I determined to preach an overview of the book of Esther uh, two months ago for such a time as this. And here we are at a global time of global panic and pandemic. And who knows but that you and I are here for such a time as this. And God's deliverance might come through us, but if we keep our peace, if we are silent, God will raise somebody else up. So the challenge today is to not hold your peace, to speak up, to say something, to be counted, to be useful for God. So we're talking about decisions for the decade, and we're, we're talking about how can I know what I'm supposed to do. And can I know? Is there any way for, for me to know exactly what God wants me to do? And I tell you, yes, there is. God has directed me. God has directed tens of thousands of people. And he can direct you. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea that, well, God just directs preachers and evangelists and missionaries and these kind of people. My friend, God directs everyone. Amen. In our story, we have Esther. And Esther is promoted to be the queen, and God directs her. But she wasn't always the queen, and he was still directing. And the name of God is not even mentioned, because that's how God does it. If you choose not to see, you won't. But if you can see the hand of God, it's there. 
It is there. This whole story happens about 100 years after the Babylonian exile. So um, uh, Israel was exiled into Babylon, and then some have been allowed to go back. And most stayed. Most of the Israelites stayed in Babylon and really have become just like the heathens. They have uh, just integrated into the society and are not wanting to be different. They're not wanting to stand up and stand out. And God is going to force them uh, to make a decision what, uh, what they're going to do and whose side they're on. I think this is very applicable to who we are today. So go back to chapter number one. And I want to read, by way of introduction, Esther 1 and probably the first seven verses. Esther 1, 1 through 7. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. So 127 provinces. That in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the year, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. And he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. So this is really what's going on. Here's a, here's a great king. He is very powerful. He's got this huge expanded reign. And he throws a feast. As a matter of fact, that is one of the themes of this whole book. 20 times it mentions the word feast in Esther. Which is interesting because in the Old Testament, feast is mentioned 24 times. So this is, this is a huge emphasis on feast as a matter of fact there are seven feasts mentioned uh seven distinct feasts that are mentioned here in the book and verse number five and when these days that 180 days were expired so that was a big party this is a party animal all right <laughs> the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in shushan the palace so this is his capital city or his citadel this is the this is Washington, D.C., all right? He's 180 days of uh, feasting and, and uh, party. And he said, all right, we're going to have another week. We haven't had enough, so we're going to have seven more days, one more week of uh, party, both unto the great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So that's the rose garden, I guess. Verse number six, where were white and green and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen, and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beads were of gold and silver upon the pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. Let's pause there. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you so grateful for this national day of prayer. And we thank you so much for those people that have assembled here and those that have assembled online. And Lord, we, we are grateful to you for allowing us to meet together and hear the word of the Lord. I pray that you would bless the visuals here and the, the, uh, the sound, and, but most of all, the truth that we are attempting to convey. Lord, might we be accurate and Father, I pray that I could bring these four points out very clearly that all would understand. And Lord, we pray that your name would be exalted and our hearts would be challenged to walk after you. And Lord, that we would submit to your word and your truth. We thank you for our president who has given this day as a day of prayer. And Lord, it is an honor to join millions of people uh, calling and invoking your name and and glorifying you and asking that you would heal our land and Lord draw us to revival we don't know much about this coronavirus and we don't know where it came from we really don't know where it's going to go and lead to we don't know what how far it's going to spread 
But Lord, we want to say that we believe you, we trust you, and that you are good and uh, righteous, and it is an honor to be called by your name. Lord, we ask that we could um, dispel fear and that we could help create faith by presenting your word and truth. Help us to make a difference in our community. Help us to reach out faithfully to Capitol Hill and uh, these different ministries that people are, are wanting to start. Lord, I pray that we could empower them and help them. And, and Father, that people would know that uh, there is a God that created all things and is never taken by surprise and is good. And Lord, that uh, your son died for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. I thank you for saving me in 1976. I thank you for changing my life. I thank you for calling me into ministry. And I thank you for empowering me and us to serve other people. Might we serve now with your truth. And Lord, all week long, help us to serve and make an impact and make a difference for good. And we ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This book of Esther was read twice by all those of the Jewish faith uh, just this week. As a matter of fact, Tuesday was uh, Purim, and Purim comes from the word to cast lots or uh, dice uh, that you would roll, and it's what Haman, the villain in the story, used to select the 13th of Adar, which was the day of the Jews. It was a genocide. It was... This is really a book about the genocide of the Jewish people and how Haman, uh, the great villain, was thwarted by the hand of God and God did some amazing things. Then Haman's ten sons were, were hanged on the gallows that he had thought to uh, hang Haman on, uh, Mordecai, Mordecai on. And Mordecai is another, he's the good guy in the story and I'm just kind of giving you an overview who's Esther's uncle. Incidentally, in 1946, a little more than 2,000 years later, after the Nuremberg trials, 10 of the chief Nazi soldiers would be hung on 10 gallows. And uh, it's an amazing story about uh, uh, one of those men named uh, Julius uh, Stryker, who uh, was about to be hung, and one of his last words is he stood up before those gallows to be hung for his horrific acts in killing and murdering millions of Jews, said Purim Fest 1946. He put his head in the noose and died. And this story, the story of Esther, is the story of God saving his people from a wicked man named Haman or Haman that had ten sons that were killed on gallows. A little weird thing. The names of those ten sons are all written out in the Hebrew word and, and copied down, copied down. It's a curious thing that all the scribes copied the the first letter of three of the sons, very small, very small script, like half size. And all the text was copied exactly that way. Well, that, those, those three numbers uh, were the exact uh, day. Those three numbers add up in the Hebrew. The, um, the letters coincide with numbers. It's the exact day, 1946. And it was alluding to the ten sons of Haman and the Nuremberg trials. And I mean, the Bible is rich. God wrote his word. It's powerful. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I would encourage you. There's all sorts of things written on this. It's not hard to find. I would encourage you to look that sort of stuff up. But that's not really what we're talking about today, even though it's a little bit curious. And everybody's kind of leaning forward and like, whoa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to be a little bit more practical here about how you can sense and see the divine hand of God leading and directing you in all that you do. 
I want you to write these four points down somewhere and uh, remember them. Uh, the first thing you need to do is realize God's gifting and favor in me. Now, I don't mean in me. I mean in you. <laughs> God has gifted you. God has favored you. As a matter of fact, not only the wonderful blessings in your life that you would count uh, yourself privileged in, and you have many of these things, but the things that are painful and hurt you. I want you to think of Esther. The hero of our story is an orphan. Her parents have died. The hero of our story is poor, has little to no education, as least at least uh, quantified by uh, the land of Persia. The hero of our story is, is left alone and has no backup and no support. But these are the very things that what she would add up as, oh, this is so much against me. These are the very things that God was going to allow her to be chosen by the king and promoted to the queen. She was living in a day when... Uh, females were not valued and were oppressed. But God needed a woman. And God needed a single woman. And God needed a single woman that wouldn't have been necessarily protected and hidden by uh, a concerned parent, but would somehow be chosen and selected and whisked off to the king's castle and be part of the king's harem. And God was going to use all this. And I want to tell you that God can use you in any way, any way he chooses. The things that you think are against you, at least in the story of Esther, were the very things that God used for her. Amen. You might have been able to quantify, say, well, if I was a, a, a rich uh, male of uh, the uh, Persian uh, descent or genealogy, then I would be, I would be, I would have something together. I would be there. In the, but that's not who God wanted. That's not who would be promoted. That's not who would be able to thwart this genocide. You know, in our discovery of who we are, which, by the way, is your first step, you've got to discover these things. It's like a kid at Christmas time. You, you come downstairs and, wow, there's gifts and there's presents. You don't realize all the things that God's given you. Don't, you don't see them. You don't value them. I mean, the first step in realizing God's gifting is to discover them. And the second step is to begin to develop them. That is, you start saying, okay, I have this little ability. I have this desire. Now I need to get better at it. Uh, maybe I need to get better at singing. Maybe I need to get better at playing the guitar. Or maybe I need to get better at uh, writing. Or maybe I need to get better at speaking. Or maybe I need to... I'm not sure what it is, but God wants you both to discover and develop your gifts so that one day you can be deployed. You can deploy that gift and use it for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I want you to see Esther discovering some of her gifts. So she's an orphan girl, uh, but she has some great things. Esther chapter 2 and verses uh, 8 and 9 really bring this out. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together to Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house, into the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her such things for purifications, such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given uh, her out of the king's house. And he uh, preferred her and her maids unto the best um, uh, unto, unto the best place of the house of the women. I, I want to just point out, she pleased him, she obtained kindness, and he promoted her and preferred her. So God blessed her with, with favor. This is an amazing thing. This is, this is wonderful. Now, here's what had happened. This big 180-day party was really coming to a great crescendo when King Ahasuerus is there and in his citadel, in his capital city, he says, let's have... Just seven more days of party. And, 
and I really want to impress everybody, and so let's have Vashti the Queen come out. And Vashti the Queen is going to come out, and she is going to display her beauty. And, she's, and, and Vashti says, nothing doing. I'm not coming out. I'm not coming out and, I don't know, dancing for you guys or, or, or just uh, uh, revealing myself uh, for you. I'm not doing it. And the king was furious. There's all sorts of different things that could have happened, but it didn't happen. And God protected her, and, but God uh, sent her to, allowed her to go to the side, which allowed his chosen, Esther, to be brought forth. Everybody in a, was in an uproar. How can anybody deny the king? And by the way, let me just say, don't uh, bow the knee to somebody's wrong edict. Uh, that is, don't just cave to whatever somebody wants. Yeah. And don't just give in. And just, uh, uh, ladies, don't, uh, uh, don't just cave in to everybody's desire to see your beauty. Your beauty is given to you by God. Your, uh, our first point, realize God's gifting in favor. You know, Vashti realized her gifting in favor. She was beautiful, but she wasn't going to display it to all the drunken fools at this big party. Amen. And so she pulled back, and she wasn't going to do it. Now the king is saying, all right, let's get somebody else. And God's favor is with Esther. Listen, God can take care of you. That's what this story is all about. So there's this big long beauty contest that goes on the people say well let's find somebody to replace uh, Vashti and let's and they selected Esther Esther is beautiful and they bring her in and they give her all this royal pampering for for a year now listen you should be able to look pretty good after a year of royal pampering all right so she's looking good and she's coming in before the king, all this royal pampering and all this sort of stuff. I want you to look at chapter 2 and verse 15. We looked at verses 8 and 9. Now look at 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor. I want you to notice that. Esther obtained what? Amen. Favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. I mean, this woman is a looker. She's a good-looking woman, but there's something more. She's part of a group. It's probably a harem that is all, these are all beautiful women and probably masters of seduction. But she is the one that is obtaining favor here. And this is, this is none other but the hand of God. Look at verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set a, the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So here, God has blessed this woman. Blessed her with things we wouldn't necessarily quantify as blessings and blessed her with favor and she is promoted in a, in a great way. And God can promote you. If you will do what God wants you to do, God can bless you, whether it's in your job, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in finding the right person to marry. If you will do what God wants you to do, God can give you favor and God can bless you. By the way, I want to encourage you to pray for favor. Pray for favor with people at your job. Pray for favor. Pray for God's direction. God wants to bless you. God wants to use you. But you've got to be dedicated to his cause. The first thing she did and you should do is realize God's gifting and favor. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, and maybe just jot that down. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, the Bible says this. As every man hath received the gift, gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So everybody's received a gift, and then we need to minister those gifts to each other, and we need to be these good stewards. That is, we've got to manage the gifting that God's given to us. So let me ask you, are you managing God's gift in your life? 
Maybe let me ask you this question. What has God given you for good? Or for the good of another? What has God given you for our country? Or your business? Or your home? Or your people? Realize God's gifting and favor. I think the devil's deceit is to have beautiful women think they're ugly and strong men to think they're weak. For people that are rich to think they're poor. People that are poor to think they're rich. And here's what I mean by that. By the way, I'm quoting C.S. Lewis there. But um, here's what I mean by that. A lot of times, people that have eternal wealth and riches will make the mistake of thinking, you know, I don't have a hundred bucks in my pocket or I, I, I'm struggling to pay this bill and I'm poor. When you are wealthy, you are wealthy. And this life is so short. And then people that, you know, have abundance of paper money today, they don't realize that it's going to be worth nothing later. You got to realize that just this week, just this week, some of the world's wealthiest people lost a third of their wealth. A third in a week. It's an amazing thing. So don't put too much stock in the world's wealth. Now, number two. Number two. Everybody still with me here? All right. Okay, good. Number two. uh, Recognize sinful injustice around me. Recognize sinful injustice around me. Now, the story of Esther is the story of Um, uh, wickedness is the story of oppression it's the story of genocide it's the story of racism it's the story of it's wickedness it's wickedness going on but God is opposed to it and God is raising people up to make a difference and to make an impact Esther chapter number 4 and let's look at verse number 4 Esther 4 and verse 4 So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. That is the story. Uh, Then was the queen what? All right, we need to loosen up. Elbow your neighbor, say, loosen up. It's okay, all right? You're not going to get coronavirus. We need to read this scripture here. So then was the queen what? Exceedingly grieved. And she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away the sackcloth from him, but he received it not now what's going on here just to shorten up the story just a little bit is um uh, mordecai is the uncle of esther and he's done this great thing he's there in the citadel he's in in the palace uh, just outside and uh, he was used in a dramatic way to thwart uh an attack on the king they were trying to kill uh, the king ahasuerus but he overheard people talking about it and made it known to Esther, who told the king, and they shut the whole thing down, saved the king. But everybody just sort of forgot about it. It was buried with fake news in that day. And uh, go ahead and chuckle just a little bit. Help me out. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then the king promoted Haman, or Haman. And Haman is this wicked man. And Haman is actually not Babylonian. Haman, Haman is um, from, a, from another tribe. He's, he's actually a Canaanite, uh, going back to the story in, um, in 1 Samuel uh, that uh, God asked King Saul uh, to, to wipe out, but he didn't. And uh, Haman is coming from that lineage and then comes out and gets uh, so stuffed full of himself, he's parading around, he says, I want everybody to bow down. And well, they all bow bow down because he's the big man on campus. And uh, there's one guy that won't, and that's Mordecai. Mordecai, which is Esther's uncle. He won't bow down. Haman, Haman, finds out that Mordecai won't bow down and says, why won't he bow down? Well, he's a Jew. He only bows down to God. Haman says, we'll fix that. I'm going to wipe out all the Jews. And he rolls the dice and uh, comes in before the king and says, King, let's make write a law to kill all the Jews. And the king signs the bill. 
They roll the dice called pure. And they roll these dice and they pick out a date 11 months from then, the 13th day of Adar. And they said, on this day, all the Jews will be exterminated. Well, this is the very thing that Esther, the queen, finds out about. And her uncle, Mordecai, is, is fasting and has torn his raiment. He's sitting in sackcloth and ashes and he's grieving. And Esther sends nice clothes to him. And he says, I don't want nice clothes. There's an, atroc an atrocity going on. This is horrible. This is awful. And so he's trying to get Esther to recognize the sinful injustice around her. Listen, Christians, we need to see sinful injustice around us. There is horrific things going on all around us. But if we're not careful, we'll just enjoy the easy life in the palace. We'll just say, my bills are paid. I'm doing well. I've got what I need and nobody's coming after me and... Uh, I guess God's going to have to take care of them. Listen, uh, all throughout the whole Bible, the Bible is filled with stories um, like uh, uh, the, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. What does that mean? That means God uses his strength and his power and God uses our strength and power. It's God working with man. It's a, it's a beautiful um, coming together. It's called the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. That's what the book of Esther is all about. God wants to do something and he's looking for somebody to partner with him and to get something done. Listen, when you see some giftedness in your life and then number two, you see some sinful atrocities around, hey, we're on the right track. God wants to do something. I wonder, do you know of any sinful atrocity around you? Now, it has to be sinful. It has to be uh, against people. The founders of our great nation spoke of certain unalienable rights. That those are rights that were not given by man and can't be taken away by man. They're given by God and can never be taken away by man. You, they can't be removed. By the way, the difference between what we would call the right and the left, and there's really not a right or a left, there's right or wrong. Okay, and I and I when I say that I'm not talking about a political party, I'm talking about what's right. I'm talking about what God said, and you know what? When it comes to rights, you can see it this way: those that see rights as come from God, and those that see rights as come from the majority, whoever the majority might be, and whenever there's a majority, there'll be a minority. And some people have described the majority as uh, two wolves and a lamb taking a vote on what they should have for dinner. Okay? So somebody is always going to be shorted. Somebody's always going to be done wrong in the mi minority. And God stands up for the minority. And God, that's what the book of Esther is all about. So I want to ask you, what do you see around you that disturbs you? Maybe just take a second and think about that and write that down. What is it that you see around you that disturbs you? Those watching online, hey, dial in on this. We're talking about God's gifting and favor. And then an atrocity that I seem just thrust in the middle of, oftentimes that I feel I can't do anything about. So let's pause, and I want you to chat. So online, talk to somebody, write it down. What's an atrocity you see around you and even here in the Graceway Studios, let's, uh, let's talk about it. What do you see around you that really makes you mad? Go ahead. What do you see that really makes you mad? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Good, good. Hmm. And, hey, this is a great time. If you're watching online, go ahead and post some of that stuff. Let's post it. Put it on there. Get her done. Would that be okay, Stephen? We, we can post that? Yes, sir. You need to use my phone? No? <laughs> uh, no phones in church. Okay. That, that rule has been waived. Superseded. by our kind of Recognize sinful injustice around me. All right, let's go on to the third point, and we're just 
going through the whole book of Esther in one, uh, one year. I'd like to teach through this whole book. Maybe, maybe it'd be this year. I love this book and studying. I got so interested. Number three, jot this down. Prioritize prayer and spiritual direction. Prioritize prayer and spiritual direction. Now, it's not just prayer, but it's fasting. This is a story. It, it's actually, it's this beautiful um, difference between uh, the heathen around that are uh, feasting and God's people that are fasting. And, you know, the early church is characterized by prayer and fasting. Uh, now, the modern church is characterized by praise and, and feasting. And we need to get back to prayer and fasting. On this day that we have declared, that our president has declared is a day of prayer. Mm. You know, there's an interesting thing here in the book of Esther. There is no complaint or bad attitude ever expressed in this writing. Which is strange. It's an interesting thing. Mm. And over and over again, we, I think we showed four times where she won the favor of people with her positive attitude. And this is in the midst of grieving for her people. And this is what the person that God used to ultimately save her people. Now, here's what I'm trying to point out. Esther could have got this horrific attitude. Esther could have become this obnoxious, mean, spirited person that just feels like, you know, a gorilla robbed of his last banana and just like upset and angry about everyone. But she's not. She's winning favor while she's aware of a plan to exterminate all of her people. Here's what you need to look for while you're praying and fasting. Write these two words down. Look for a calling and look for a contact. God is going to call. Matter of fact, God has been calling. God will continue to call you. And he will place you in a network or with a contact that can make a, a difference in somebody's life. See, prayer is reaching for the unseen. But fasting is letting go of the seen. Reaching for what you don't have and fasting is letting go of what you do have. I don't want this. I want that. And I can't see it. And I can't get to it. And God, would you reveal it to me? Now, Esther could have just sat in her position in the palace with her, with her, uh, with her king. But look at chapter 4, verse number 13. 13 and 14. The Bible says this, Then uh, Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself, that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. So Mordecai I was aware of this idea that Esther might have been thinking, well, I'm safe. I'm in this wall. I've got this position. I've got this crown. I have this favor. I'm going to be good. And Mordecai is saying, listen, it's not true. On the 13th of Adar, they're coming after you as well. But look at verse number 14. And I want you to underline this in your Bible if you have a habit of marking your Bible. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time. And that arrested my attention. You know, many times I've been in a situation and I've held my peace. It means to keep silent. It means to not speak up and not do something about it. But I like how it says, hold thy peace. That is, I'm going to hold on to the safety I've got right now. I'm going to hold my peace. More than just keeping quiet. And that's what we do. We see this situation and we know if we speak up or say something, we're in the fray. We could get in trouble. If thou holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And then here's this famous phrase right here at the bottom. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? 
And I want to say to you, you are here. You are blessed of God. You are placed here by divine direction. Don't get the crazy idea, this is just by chance. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm doing here. No, listen, God had it planned. God knew, God ordained, God directed, both with blessings and uh, liabilities. And God's put us, equipped us with needs. Esther had needs. That's why she was promoted. She would have never been promoted had she been blessed in another situation. The same is true with Joseph. God blessed Joseph with brothers that sold him into slavery. Had he not been sold into slavery, he would have never been brought into Egypt. And then God blessed a Joseph with, with a, a man, a boss, a master that threw him into jail. And then God blessed him with being forgotten so that he could go to the top. And that's how God works. You've got to trust the hand of God. Now, I think here's a, here's a strong thought. Esther is all about the unseen hand of God, but the heart that you can trust. That is the heart of God. And I want to tell you, you can trust the heart of God even though you can't see his hand. A great passage on fasting, and I want to encourage us to fast during this uh, time of global pandemic in our, in, our, in our world. Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 11, speaks of fasting. And fasting really allows the soul to command the body. And most of the time it's the other way around. The body is telling you what to do. And you are a soul. And you have a body. But fasting allows your soul, you, to tell your body what to do. And by the way, um, parents and those single that will be parents, um, don't let children tell you what to do. God made them small and you big for a reason. You tell them what to do, and, and the goal is not to just always tell your kids what to do. The goal is that they will learn to tell themselves what to do. And a good um, adult, a mature person, is somebody that is controlling themselves and dominating their own desires. So I want to lash out and say this, but I don't because I'm going to control myself. I want to punch that guy in the face, but I won't because I discipline myself. I want to do whatever, 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 because my body is saying yes, 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 and my soul says no. Control yourself. Okay. And my mom and dad told me that before, but now I'm a big boy, so I have to tell myself that. All right? <laughs> Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 11. Is not this the, ch the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. And look at this list of all these things that prayer and fasting does. To loose the bands of wickedness. Is there bands or chains or cords of wickedness around our society? Mm -hmm. To undo the heavy burdens. And to let the oppressed go free. And that they break every yoke? Verse number seven. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out of thy house? When thou, hast, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. It's talking about getting involved, getting engaged in problems, and not just, I don't see that. Oh, I don't see that. Let's just keep on going. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily. And that's a great verse for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear reward. What that means is God's glory is going to be our protection. He's going to protect us when I can't see something coming. God's going to be with us. You say, how do I do that? By fasting. Well, what's fasting? That's 
purposely weakening the body, purposely putting the body in a vulnerable state so that I'm dependent on the spiritual. Look at verse number nine. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee thy yoke, the yoke and the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity, that's accusation and pride and arrogance, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light Rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. One more verse, verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. Now that's our theme here today. Can I get divine direction? Can God steer my life? Does the hand of the Lord guide and direct me? And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought. And make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. By the way, this little phrase, thy bones, uh, make fat thy bones, one of the things that depletes calcium faster than anything else is worry. Worry, and when you wring out your soul, and uh, it steals away the calcium from our body. So there's three things so far. We've seen, we've got to realize God's gifting and we've got to recognize sinful injustice around us. And we've got to prioritize prayer and a spiritual direction. That is, you've got to come away. You've, don't be so busy. I think every day you ought to set aside some time and, and seek the Lord. Read his word. And, and don't, just, don't just read to read to read to read and... But listen, listen as you read. Uh, there are some mornings where I just read a verse or two and I'll write all sorts of notes. There are other mornings I'll read a verse or two or three and, and I'll just listen. My mind is just filled with things and honestly, I dare not write. Not that I think I'm going to remember, but I dare not interrupt the Lord. I feel like he's talking to me and I don't want to look down. And there's other days... I don't hear a thing. I'm like, ooh, okay, I'm done. What did I read? I'm not sure. Now, I don't want to advertise those days. But <laughs> listen, God will speak to you. God will lead you and guide you. God created you and designed you and engineered you for a purpose. But you'll be powerless without his direction. Now, here's the fourth thing, and we'll be done. Number four, I've got to verbalize my faith and commitment. I've got to verbalize my faith and commitment. In Esther chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and there's certainly a hundred more points that we could bring out and we could study this for weeks, but in verse number 15 and 16, then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fa fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. She verbalized her faith, and she verbalized her commitment. She said the famous phrase, I don't know if I'm going to live, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to go forward. Let's make a team. Let's fast. Let's pray together. Let's be engaged. And if I perish, I perished. In Matthew chapter 9, and verse number 29, Jesus said to those that he was healing, according to your faith, be it unto you. And that's how God works. So what do you believe? What are you believing God for? And Esther's saying, I'm asking you to fast and pray with me so that I can go before the king, which is not according to the law. I'm going to go before him, and if I die, and I could be executed, I die. You know, there's an incredible reversal here. Haman was trying to kill the Jews on the 13th of Adar. 
And he was hanged on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. And so the reversal and this unique thing that God is doing. In much the same way, the devil was crushed by the cross that he sought to destroy Jesus on. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, the Bible says this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, speaking of Jesus, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, made an open show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is, the devil and the spiritual forces thought to mock and destroy Jesus Christ, just as Haman thought to mock and destroy the Jewish people, and it was all reversed. And there were more gallows built, and the ten sons of, of Haman or Haman were hung on the very gallows. And I told you about 1946, when... Uh, in October, actually, it wasn't the spring with Purim, but uh, Julius Stricker stood up and said, Purim Fest 1946, a little more than 2,000 years later. It's an incredible, incredible story. God wants to use you to do amazing things. God is using people all through the world right now, and there's, there's lots of atrocities but you're going to have to dial in and see what God is going to do. You know, the greatest thing is what I just spoke of, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God's Son, died on the cross for you and for me. He died to save us. He didn't just die to give us a better life. He didn't just die to make us happier. He died, died to give us a home in heaven. Have you received his free gift? Have you repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you declared yourself on the winning side, the side of the Lord Jesus Christ? So coronavirus is raging through the globe and there's panic and pandemic. Certainly there's politics going on all over the place, but it can be reversed. You know the funny thing? When, the, when Esther told the king... There were some more feasts and all kinds of cool stuff. The king was enraged. They put a bag over the head of Haman and they hung him. But he found out he couldn't just reverse the order. The law was given and it couldn't be changed. So the 13th of, of uh, that day, he, they were going to be executed. And so what the king did is he said, I command that all the Jews on the 13th of Adar defend themselves and fight against the enemies and kill anybody that attacks them. And that's how Haman's sons were killed. You know, that's what God does with you and I. God doesn't come in and destroy evil, which he could. But God commands us to fight back. God commands us to defend ourselves. When we pray, God, come and destroy this evil, God, come and do that, God's not going to do that. God doesn't work that way. God commands us to go out and make a difference. Now, Romans chapter 12 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That means you've got to fight, you've got to step forward, and God wants to empower you to make a difference. So stop being so passive, Christians. Stop being so complacent. And reach out and ask for the power of God and make a difference. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I'd like to ask our instrumentalists if they would come and play. And I want to thank you for joining us here today, presently and uh, online, virtually. And I want to say God wants to use you. The very first step is to repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That cross, it's a wonderful cross. It's the place where my sins were paid, your sins were paid. But you're going to have to trust Him. Put your faith in Jesus. You need to pray something like this from your, from your heart. You need to pray something like this. God, 
I agree with you. I know I'm a sinner. I've, I've broke your law. I've transgressed your way. And I admit it. I own it. I have, I have sinned. God, would you save me? And now put your faith in Jesus. Just something like this. God, I believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day. Would you, would you save me? Now don't ask for a feeling. Don't ask for a sign. Take God at his word. Just right now, just say, God, I trust you. I believe your word. I believe that part about if, if I repent, that you'll save me. Pray that from your heart. If I repent and put my trust in you, you'll save me. Say something like, God, I do, I do trust you. I do believe. Thank you for saving me. Pray that in your heart. Christians, God's not going to cancel evil. But he's asking you to not be overrun or overcome by it, but to overcome evil with good. Would you right now in your heart, right where you're at, say, God, how can I overcome evil? What do I need to do? What do I need to stay away from? What is it that you've placed in my life that I'm not using, I'm not believing, I'm not following? God, help me. Would you pray that now? And Tori, would you come lead us in our invitation? The invitation is this. If, if you need to be praying, if you want to kneel down, man, do that. You need to write a text. You need to write a letter. You need to make a call. You need to surrender your life. Whatever it is, be serious. Be engaged. Don't let anything distract you. This is the most important time. God, what do you want me to do? And then do it for the glory and the honor. King Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now.
much for coming today. Thank you for tuning in online. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for the, the people that came and, um, and worshiped together with us. Thank you for the ability to sing and to worship you. And thank you for the, the amazing message we, uh, we heard today. I pray we would be able to apply it to our lives and that you would bless us as a church today. It's your name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.